Good morning again. Why don't we uh, pray together? Father, thank you for allowing us, allowing us to come here. Um, for Corey, Lord, leading us this morning in worship, for the songs that we were able to sing. Father, thank you for uh, the sun that's come out today, Lord, that provides that little bit of warmth in the midst of this cooler weather. Thank you for the family and friends that gather here now, Lord, as followers of Christ. Be with us this morning. Help us to see your son in this text, to hear your gospel, to know that it applies to us, and then to live it out. Be with us, Lord, in your name. Amen. Well, some of you guys know that this week my daughter was in a play at the high school for Sound of Music, so I've seen The Sound of Music five times this week. And if I break out into song, you will know why. Um, somebody asked me what I was preaching on, and I said, I'm actually just going to read the script of Sound of Music, call it a day. Your help comes from the hills. See you guys later. Um, so we're, we're actually in the letter of, jo of First John. So if you want to open up, why don't you go there, uh, open up to First John chapter 4. And we're going to continue considering the implications of what Jesus has done. We've looked at a couple things that John wants us to know. One is we must know who Jesus is, that Jesus is the Son of God who came in the flesh and dwelt among us. And then we must know what Jesus has done, and that is that he has reconciled our relationship to God the Father. And those, out of those two realities flow everything else in the Christian life. If we get those two right, then we'll get everything else right. If we get those two wrong, then everything else is going to be a challenge for us. We must know who Jesus is, and we must know what he has done. And those two realities, as we've said, change everything. But John doesn't just want you to know that they might change or that they are changing. He wants you to know that they're changing you. And how can you have the assurance that those two truths have been applied in your life so that you begin to live out the Christian life itself? And so this is one of his principal points in this letter, uh, for you to know that you're saved, to have assurance, and therefore to differentiate between those who really are children of God and those who aren't. You know, those who live in the kingdom of light, as he calls it, and live in the kingdom of darkness, or those who live in the kingdom of hate, the realm of hate, or those who live in the realm of love. He says there's really only two options and there's not a third way. And the difference between these two is going to flow from who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. But the real question for us is how do I know which realm or which kingdom that I'm actually in? And that's what we've been considering the last couple of weeks. And, and John has told us that there are going to be a few things that flow out of you that demonstrate to you and prove to you and show you that you really are a child of God. And the first of those was obedience. That John says that you can know that you are saved and that you are part of the family of God because you are increasing in your obedience of God's command. That we ought to practice righteousness. That we are beginning to live now the way that we will live for all of eternity. That if we've been brought into Christ and therefore we have eternal life, that our current life now will begin to reflect the eternal reality that's already present in you. And that's either going to be living according to the commands of God or living contrary to the commands of God. And so the way we live now will be indicative of the type of life that not only we expect to have, but the type of life we actually have right now. The second one, he says, uh, first we begin with obedience, and that's necessarily going to flow into love for your brother you will know that you're really children of God when we find ourselves growing in love for the people around us. And again, taken in the context of eternal life, uh, we, we see that the kingdom of God is the kingdom of love. And the kingdom of the evil one or the devil is the kingdom of hate. And so if you are part of the kingdom of God, then you will begin to exhibit characteristics of a loving person, that you will love people. But he says it's not just the brothers that will love, some sort of general ambiguous statement about people will love. But he says it actually, you'll begin to notice it because you will love specific people, not just the brothers, but that brother, the, the brother sitting next to you or the sister sitting next to you in the pew, that you will love the people that are really in your community, in your neighborhoods, your coworkers, your friends, whatever. But not only will you love specific people, but you will love them in specific ways that you will begin to see that you become a more sacrificial person and a more generous person and a giving person so that your life, the characteristic that will flow out of it, is that instead of trying to use others for your own gain, you will give of yourself for their gain. And both of these things 
uh, have to be understood in the proper order. That obedience and love for your neighbor are not the means through which you will earn God's love. But rather, because you have God's love, what will flow out of you is obedience and is love. If you get that order confused, then you begin to think that you become self-righteous. You begin to think that God loves you more because you are more obedient or whatever. But it's never actually going to provide you assurance because you are guaranteed to fail. You are not always an obedient person. And you are not always a loving person. But when you understand that the only way for you to truly be obedient or the only way for you to truly be loving is that you have received God's love first, then it begins to flow out of you into an increasing obedience to God's commands and an increasing love for your neighbor that goes beyond just the standard, of course, we love everybody. And so we see that obedience and love don't need to be perfectly present, but they need to be consistently present. And so we said when we talked about righteousness that it was about what you're practicing. That right now, we begin to practice the way that we, uh, we begin to practice living out who we already are in Christ. Well, today, we're going to look at a third reality of how you can know that you are saved. There's one more way, love, obedience, and one more that we will consider today. So if you want to read with me from 1 John 4, starting in 1 through 6. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world." They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. In his commentary on 1 John, John Stott says that there are three assurances that the believers will have, or what he calls three tests to know whether or not you really are saved. The first one was love. The, the test, or the first one is obedience, the uh, test of following, the test of obedience. The second will be the test of love. And the third one he calls the doctrinal test. Now, John has already, John, the author of this letter that we just read, has already visited each of those. But the doctrinal test is the one that we really dive into today. We've already mentioned it in the past, but now we get to dig into the details. And I would suggest that a better word than doctrinal test is the question of discernment. It's the question of the ability to discern truth from falsehood. That the believer and the follower of Christ will have the ability to know things that are true and therefore are from God, or those that are false and therefore are from the world and are from the evil one. Now, all of these are important because in the, in the one sense, I think we can think about love and obedience as something that flows from out, out of us, whereas discernment is something to do with what's on the outside. As we look around us, we're able to discern what is true and false in the external world to us. But the truth is that all of these must be taken together because what John is indicating is that there is a whole person transformation that's happening in you. That we are mind, soul, will, heart, all being transformed into the likeness of Christ. So obedience, for example, relates to your will. Christ has transformed your will so that now you desire to do things God's way. Doesn't mean you always will. Paul writes in Romans that there are things that he wants to do that he doesn't do and things he doesn't want to do that he does, but still his desire, what he wants to do, is God's will. He says, who's going to save me from this body of flesh? He's saying, I, 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 I want to do what God wants to do. Our will has been changed. It's a transformation of the will. That's what obedience is. Love, of course, relates to the heart. Christ has so transformed your heart that rather than primarily loving yourself, you actually begin to love others. In the musical, Sound of Music, there's a, there actually is a great analogy there that I just thought of. But, you know, they actually, they, oh man, I watch it too many times. I'm telling you, it is rough. But um, Liesl asks Maria, how do you know that you love Father? And she goes, because I don't love myself anymore. I think primarily of him. 
How do you know that you have been transformed, that your heart has been transformed, that you now begin to love others uh, and you self-sacrifice and you serve for others? That's how you know that your heart has been transformed. That's why Jesus himself, he, you know, he says, hateful people hold themselves in higher regard than they hold others so that they end up robbing people of their very humanity. And that's the reason that Jesus and John both equate hate to murder. That murder is robbing somebody of their very essence. Hate does the same thing to others. But love, on the other hand, sacrifices to build up others. It gives of what's most essential and most important to us so that others can have freedom. That's love, the total transformation of our heart. But when we come to discernment of truth and falsehood, falsehood, what we find is that it's a complete transformation of our mind. John says that you are either going to be from the world or from God, but you can't be from both. I remember one of my professors describing worldliness as anything that makes godliness look foolish. And godliness, anything that makes worldliness look foolish. It's a complete transformation of the mind. Romans 12, verse 1. Do not be conformed anymore to the patterns of this world, but be, rene- be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's discernment. That you, believer in Christ, are having your mind transformed so that you can discern truth from falsehood. But if that's going to matter, we have to understand why it's important. And the Romans passage is just one indicator that the pattern of the world is contrary to the way God has called us to live. But it's the consistent teaching of the New Testament that there is a real battle going on around us. And it is a battle between what is evil and what is good, what is false and what is true. And it is a spiritual battle that is being waged all around us. We must know, we must be aware that there are spirits of truth And there are spirits of falsehood in the world. So John says in verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. The New Testament, like I said, is well aware that what we are dealing with is really and truly a spiritual battle. Paul says in Ephesians that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but with the powers and principalities of this dark world. That the, that the real battle is the one happening in the realm that we can't see, the spiritual realm that's just outside, just behind the veil of this one. John, of course, is the author who wrote the book of Revelation. And a lot of times when we read the book of Revelation, uh, we see it and read it as a prophecy of what is going to happen down the road. And there's no doubt that there may be elements there. And we read it thinking that's what's going to happen in the future. But many commentators and scholars look at the book of Revelation and go, this is not something you're supposed to read about what will happen. It's something you're supposed to read about what is happening. That the book of Revelation is supposed to be read alongside of the book of Acts. So that when we read the book of Acts, we see what's happening in the world around us. But when we read the book of Revelation, what we see is that same story happening in the heavenly realms. That it's a spiritual battle taking place. Regardless of whether it's a present reality or a future one, at least one thing is clear in the book of Revelation and in the New Testament generally, that there is more going on that you and I can see. And you must be aware of it. And we also need to understand how it's going to play itself out. Because even if you find yourself, and I know some of you come from you know, backgrounds in a Reformed tradition that's very intellectual, so we don't like to think about things we don't understand. And so even if, and I'm not suggesting you do, but even if you don't want to put it in spiritual terms, you can certainly look at the world and think about how evil and how falsehood are going to play itself out, how you are going to see this battle between truth and falsehood. And the challenge for the Christian is that sometimes things look good on the surface, but in reality, they are not. In fact, the way that evil and darkness always masquerade is as servants of light. They always wear the mask of servants of light. This is where we get the phrase that something can be like a wolf in sheep's clothing. That they look safe, but in truth, they aren't. Evil very often hides under the disguise of good. Now, there are many situations in life where you see this in culture all the time. Not long ago, uh, there was a march on Washington for women's rights. And this is a great cause. 
In America, there are still areas of our society, we've seen it recently and we see it uh, uh, very frequently if you're interested in looking into these things, where women are still treated differently than men in the boardroom, in the, in the corporate environment, in different areas like that. Sexual harassment at work is not uncommon and it seems that even in many areas of corporate America, if you read the stories and stories came out about companies like Uber and other companies where this was happening on a rampant level high up in the corporate structure where women were being sexually harassed and it seems like the higher you go and the more power you have and the more money you have to get away with it the more likely that men were going to take advantage of those situations there's still a wage gap that exists America lags behind other countries in benefits being paid for paternity leave and if we expand outside of America we might think of many developing nations where half of the workforce is not being utilized because young women are not taught the same skills as young men man that's a great cause to fight for women's rights, not just in America and all across the globe. The problem is, you could believe everything that I just said and be convicted about wanting to work towards a solution and not be welcome at that women's march. And the reason that you wouldn't be welcome at that march is because what society and culture has said is that if you really believed in women's advancement, you wouldn't just accept all of those good things that I just said, but you would also accept that women should be able to have abortions whenever they want. That should be their choice. And if you don't believe in abortion, then you can't claim to care about women. You see, that's evil masked underneath good. That's evil masquer that's masquerading as light. There's other examples something that we're passionate about and working towards in our church and in our community, racial reconciliation. Many of you at Restore are involved and, and at the broader community at Eastern Christian and other places are involved with real, tangible works of saying, how can we demonstrate to the world what real reconciliation and real unity looks like? I consider it somewhat of an obligation to speak on it as often as it comes up. When we see examples in our culture that are antithetical to how Christ has called us to live, whether that's an event like that which happened in Charlottesville not too long ago or others. But here's what's crazy. You can believe all of that. And you can say that you are aware that ethnic minorities and black people in particular in America have not been given the same opportunities. And you can work towards reconciliation. And you can care about it and fight for it and speak about it. And culture will say, well, if you really cared about the oppressed, you would also care about all of these other people groups that they throw in as well. And all of these other issues so that even if you fight for racial oppression but you don't speak up, say, about gender issues, you're still a bigot. That's evil masquerading as good. Both of those examples are the world as it is telling you that if you were really good, if you really cared about things, you'd also agree about all these other things too. You'd also embrace the full agenda, not just the things that God tells us are right and good, but also the things that society tells us are right and good. That's how the devil leads believers astray. The main issue looks good, so I guess I also have to accept everything else as well. The problem is that's the same trick the devil has been playing from the very beginning. That the very start of the whole reason the world is the way that it is, the most deceptive type of evil is when Satan himself and the devil himself and evil itself shows up and looks at you and says, did God really say, he uses God's words against you and twists them and reinterprets them in a way that seems good, but in reality isn't. Adam falls for the lie. Jesus doesn't. You see, discernment is the ability to not fall for the lie. And that leads us into the reasons that John gives us for how it is that we can have discernment and how it is that it gives us assurance, and it begins with this. Discernment begins with our confession of Christ. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming, and now is in the world already. What do you say about Jesus? That's where all this starts. 
We've said that from the beginning, that for John, everything flows out of who you say Jesus is. He was God, made his dwelling among us who we could touch, look at, listen to, and see with our very eyes. He was the exact imprint of the very nature of God. And so when we think of God, we think of him through the lens of Jesus. When we approach God, we approach him through the work of Jesus. Everything flows from what we believe about Jesus. And the reason it matters is because if Jesus is God, then he must be trusted. There are not two ways about this. You can't say that Jesus is God and then not trust him. You can't say that Jesus is God and yet I disagree with everything that he taught me. That would be elevating yourself above God. Saying, I actually know better than God. And if that's possible, then you are God not him. But if you say that Jesus is God, then you will also, by definition, agree with what he teaches about truth and that anything contrary to his teachings is a lie. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, this is what he's talking about. I am the truth. You will not find truth unless you come from me. And so this is why John says that, or John Stott, again in his commentary, says that this is a doctrinal test. How will you know if you truly have Christ? If Christ's work has been applied to you, the answer will be, do you trust what Jesus has said? Do you believe that Jesus' teachings are true? Do you believe that what Jesus believed was correct? That's how we'll know. First, because Jesus is necessary to empower our discernment. That we actually require that Jesus demonstrate to us and empower what discernment will look like. Without Jesus, we end up like Adam. We make choices that seem good on the surface, but in reality are evil. If we went back and looked at that story in the Garden of Eden, that's one of the points that the text is making to us. Adam is literally in the middle of this lavish paradise, able to eat whatever he wants. But the thing that tips him over the edge is that he sees that the fruit was good for eating. He sees good that was hiding the evil underneath that for him to go and take that fruit actually meant that he would be disobedient to God. Jesus, on the other hand, when he's standing in the wilderness in the midst of nothing and really truly is hungry and the devil says to him, don't be ridiculous, of course you can eat, you can turn that stone on the ground into food, it looks good on the surface. But Jesus says no, because underneath is disobedience. And so he doesn't do it. If we're going to make the move from unwise choices and having unwise discernment to a place of wisdom and truth, it's going to require that we actually have Jesus living in us through the power of his spirit so that we aren't left to our own devices. And this is what John says has happened. Your confession of Jesus is how you know that you've been given the spirit of God. So not only do we need Jesus to demonstrate and empower us, but we need the spirit of God to apply those truths and guide us in discernment. To put it in the context of our assurances so far, obedience proves that we have trusted Jesus. Love for our brothers proves that we have trusted Jesus. And now John is telling us that what we believe about truth will prove that we have trusted Jesus. So that leads us to the last thing. We've considered why discernment's important. We discovered where discernment comes from. And now you must know, how do you actually practice discernment? Okay, I want to be a discerning person. Hopefully you're sitting here going like, wow, nobody sits here in church and goes, boy, I really hope I fall for some lies today. Everybody wants to have some discernment. We want to know the difference between truth and falsehood. So how do you know? What are the resources that you've been given? The first thing you need to understand is that if this really truly is a renewal of our minds, then discernment is going to flow from reason. That we must test the spirits. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see where they are from God. The side note in the English Standard Version of the Study Bible is that true faith is not gullibility. Christians are not intellectually foolish. Rather, Christians have an extra measure of intellect to be able to test whether things are the way that they are. When Paul says that there is a foolishness about Christianity, it's only because everything about Christianity is totally backwards from the way things are in the world. That it seems foolish, but it's actually true. And as believers, therefore, we look at the world and go, sometimes it seems good, but it's actually foolish. The cross is foolishness precisely because it was death and seeming defeat that ultimately brings life and victory. It doesn't make sense unless you understand who Jesus is. So discernment's going to flow from your reason, from your transformed mind. True faith always follows from reason. If you have faith, It is because, and you have true faith, 
It is because you have come to the reasonable and rational conclusion that Jesus is who he said he is, and he has done what he said he will do. And therefore, as we discern the world around us, it too begins with our reason. The second thing we must know, if we are to practice discernment, is that the source of truth is God's word. Verse 5 to 6. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. And by this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. What did God actually say? That's If we want to discern what is true and false, we go to God's word and not just to give it lip service. You see, the easiest path to falsehood is to get you to believe something that's close to the truth, but in reality is not the truth. And there are a lot of believers who I've come into contact with who've been in the church for so long that they believe something that's close to the truth, but isn't actually the truth. That they, they believe something that kind of looks like truth, but left to its own devices isn't actually true. Because you don't fall head first into deception. Right? Like you don't, you don't fall head first into falsehood. The, the way you get there, the way you fall into real falsehood is by little lies that add up over time. Falling for the small things over time that lead to bigger lies and so on until eventually you live in a world of falsehood. And again, many Christians do that. You've heard the expression, I know just enough to be dangerous. Like me when I go to do electrical work in my house. I'm either going to fix the problem or I'm going to shock myself into oblivion, like Clark Griswold. That's how a lot of Christians are with their biblical knowledge. You know just enough to be dangerous. That's why we see Christians throw out cliche verses, right? Like even the one we read today, right? Wasn't it? This is one of the ones we love to say. Greater is he who is in you than greater than he who is in the world. Okay, what does that mean? It means I can overcome. Okay, what can you overcome? Uh, it means I'm stronger. What are you stronger than? It means I can do things. What can you do? I don't know. I know just enough to be dangerous. I know the verse. I have no idea what the context is or what John is actually saying. See, it's little lies. Now, if we're actually willing to learn and submit ourselves to what God tells us, in a sense, we need our hearts transformed before our heads will be transformed. You need to have God uh, create a willingness in you to actually listen and hear what he's telling you, but then you need to use reason. So it's okay that you don't have all the biblical knowledge that you might want. It's okay to not know everything, um, but you need to be willing to submit yourself to the possibility that you might be wrong if someone can show it to you from the Scripture. I can tell you stories of how this has happened in my life. One time, it really wasn't a big deal. I didn't preach heresy or anything like that. I didn't preach uh, falsehood, thankfully. Well, I guess I did preach falsehood, but uh, it was a little one. It was a little white lie. I, the first time, which is not good. You can't, you can't, a little white lies when you're preaching, not good. But I was standing up, it was, we were uh, at the Shep this week talking about the first time we preached, and that got me to thinking about a story. The first time I preached to adults, I had, I had spoken to teenagers uh, three times a weekend for years and years and years, and now it was the first time that I was going to speak in front of adults. And it was a big sanctuary, 1,100 people, uh, and I was on the third time that I was, that was preaching the sermon, and I uh, said something jokingly about how there were, because you know I was the youth pastor of the church, and so like youth pastors always do, they want to prove to everyone that their job is harder than everyone else's, because really they just play games all day. Um, and so they have to find some biblical rationale for why they really are doing God's work. And so that's what I had to do, prove myself. And so I said, well, you know, the thing that's really difficult about leading teenagers is that there's no teenagers in the Bible. Now, what I meant was that there were no adolescents in the Bible, that we deal with this thing now in our culture where there's a big gap between biological adulthood when a child hits puberty and real, actual cultural adulthood when a kid actually, like, moves out of their parents' basement, gets a job, and rents their first apartment. And now, you know, biological adulthood is like 11 or 12, and cultural adulthood is like 35. And so you have this whole period of adolescence, right, where, they, where you live in this in-between of not really knowing whether you're an adult or whether you're a child. Well, I was kind of making a joke about that. Well, Doug, uh, Doug was 
this really wise man who worked at the church. He was the church janitor at the time. And if you talk to him, you realize that actually Doug had this history in ministry. He was friends with some of the more well-known pastors uh, in, in the Northeast, Was really had this incredible story, one of the wisest and most gentle men you've ever met and humble men. And of course, he laughed during the sermon. And then the next day on my desk, there was a, there was a note from Doug and it said, Jeremy, I thought you'd be really interested to read about these teenagers in the Bible. And he, and he gave me a whole paper that he had written about teenagers. And uh, I was like, dang it, Doug. That's not what I meant. But he was right. You know, he was right. And, and to point out that, hey, um, you know, he knew that I misspoke, but he wasn't willing to let me just go with it because he said, but you need to know that actually the scripture is quite different from what you think it is. And he helped correct even that little small thing. You know, I've, I've met many people who profess to be Christians who have no interest in knowing what God says. And they have no interest in really listening to it. They have no interest in submitting to it. And John's response to that would be to say, if you don't care what God says, then you are not really one of us. That this is the issue that Christians are facing in the world. That if you don't listen to God's word, and you don't listen to the apostles, then you aren't really listening to Christ. And if you aren't really listening to Christ, then how can you claim to trust him. People who are in the family of God go to the word of God in order to give us the resources we need to discern truth from falsehood. And so there are three things that you can do to go to the word of God. And I'm going to say them briefly as we close. Three tips, three encouragements. How can you practice discernment? The first is when you face questions you are unsure of or you are face gray areas or areas that are murky, you must go to the scripture and ask, what does God's word say about this issue? What God's word says or doesn't say about any issue will help you understand, first of all, how important that issue actually is. You know, there are some things that we get really caught up in and really nervous about. And you go, well, what does God's word say? It doesn't say anything. Well, don't stress yourself out then. You know, don't, don't lose it over those things. But if God's word does speak on an issue, you can be confident that it is true and we can apply it and live it out. This is why as covenant members, we uh, say right when we're talking in our covenant membership classes that we have three circles that every issue falls into. The circle of essentials, the circle of convictions, and the circle of preferences. And the way that you know where an issue falls is how clear the Bible speaks about an issue. If the Bible is clear, then you can have confidence that that is an essential thing. If the Bible speaks, but not with as much clarity, then that's a conviction and if the spirit does not speak at all, or the word does not speak at all, then it is a preference. But the central piece is asking, what does God's word say? Here's the second encouragement. Ask yourself, what is God's spirit saying to me about this issue? God's spirit in you will never direct you in a way contrary to what God's word has said. And so we can have confidence, and again, a lot of times, because we, many of us, grew up in an intellectual background, we really don't give the Spirit a lot of credit. It's more about what I can figure out. But actually, in the New Testament, as you read it, it seems pretty clear that John and the other apostles felt pretty certain that every single one of us who followed Christ already had the resources in us to discern truth from falsehood, and that resource was the Holy Spirit. That they trusted that you, Christian person, could go and open your scripture, you could read it as is, even in an English translation, and you could figure out what God was really saying. That we already have the Spirit. You know, so many Christian people, they want to micromanage other Christians' spiritual walk. I don't know if you've seen this. Christians love, especially Christian leaders sometimes, they want to micromanage how the Spirit should be working in you. You know what the New Testament authors would say? There is a reason you don't have to do that for others. Because if someone around you is a believer, they already have a micromanager. It's called the Holy Spirit living inside them that is going to guide them into all truth. That is the Spirit's role. You can trust it in yourself and you can trust it in others. Paul says that there are going to be things that you are convicted about that might not have any bearing on any other Christian. You might be convicted that for you, you are not allowed to touch a drop of alcohol. Live out that conviction. For you to ignore that would be for you to deny the commands of Christ. But that's not necessarily a conviction 
for every believer. Trust the spirit that is already in you. First, go to God's word. Second, trust the spirit. And here's the third thing. Ask yourself, what is the consensus of the Christian community? What is the consensus, the consensus of the Christian community? John refers to we, and he does that intentionally. He's not just saying, listen to me. He's saying, listen to we. He was referring to the apostles, but he's also referring to the collective we in the church of Ephesus. And when we refer to that collective, we are referring to all believers, not just who live now across the globe, but those who've lived throughout all of historical Christianity. That since Christ has been risen from the dead, there have been believers who have been interpreting what Christ has said. And when we go to the scripture, we should ask ourselves, what is the consensus of that community? Because there are areas where the Bible might not be as clear, where it leaves room for ambiguity or interpretation. But you will find that even in those areas, if there is not, there will be a significant portion of believers who agree with the conclusions that you have come to that they will support your conclusions. And if you cannot find that there's a significant portion of people who agree with your conclusions, you are probably wrong. And what that means for us is, first of all, that you have to remember that you are an American Christian. That your view of Christianity is shaped by the Western world that you live in. But if you took a step back from some of the things that we took for granted as American Christians, and you looked at Christianity across the globe, you would find, for example, that the individualism that's rampant in American evangelicalism is not present in other cultures where the community is valued over the individual. And you might discover that maybe when we focus so much on our personal piety, We have missed what the scripture is actually teaching because we live in America. You might find that ideas that are being, that are coming out now from different corners of Christianity that seem like they're totally radical and new ideas about who Jesus is or totally new and radical ideas about what God has said about certain things like marriage or whatever it might be. And you might go, oh, see, we're so much more progressive, but let's take a step back and consider that for 2,000 years, Years across millennia, across the globe, Christians have had a remarkably consistent view of what God says about marriage. And so our view, though it may be popular, is nevertheless inaccurate. We must ask ourselves, what is the consensus of the Christian community, not just across the global church, but across historical Orthodox Christianity. And we may discover that some of the things we think we believe are actually extreme outliers in terms of the consensus of the apostles and the church. If no one in all of history has interpreted Scripture a certain way, then why should we start now? Here's the end of the matter. A child of God will be able to discern truth from falsehood. And it is more important now than it has ever been. And we can be confident that God's word and the spirit within us will lead us into all truth, that we will not be taken down a road of falsehood. You say, how can that be possible in the world that we live? And John says, little children, you are from God and you have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And so we can live in truth and we will be guided to life. We are not left without power because God has overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, what a blessing it is to speak your truth. Would we be people who desire to see what you would say? to put our trust in you that even when we don't understand those things or we're not sure we agree, as one person said, Father, when we don't trust uh, what's going on, when we don't trust our circumstances, when we don't trust what you have said, may we trust your heart. Be with us, Father, in your name.